Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first official debrief show of Channel 781 News as we attempt to separate headlines uh, from thorough discussions. Uh, we're hoping we can chat about current issues that are going on in the city, as well as keeping everyone up to date with what's going on at the City Council and other municipal meetings. Uh, there will be a segment in each of these. Um, about what's going on at the city council when they do have meetings, but they won't be back uh, from their summer recess until next week. So this week we're going to chat about the primary that had just happened. And, uh, but first we're gonna chat with special guest, Christine Mackin about the mayor and armory project. Um, so first I wanna introduce everyone. Um, I'm joined by our usual team of James Kerkelis. Hello everyone. Josh Castor. Hello. And folks may remember Emily Sperry from some of our other segments, but she's agreed to come on as a more regular participant in our debrief shows, which we're very happy about. So thank you for that, Emily. Hello. And of course, our special guest, Kristen Mackin. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming on. Um, so Josh, if you could introduce the topic of uh, the armory and why it's relevant now uh, with the mayor deciding to run for uh, an unprecedented sixth term. Sure. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. So we've been thinking about how do we how do we talk about the mayor leading up to the election and how do we introduce people who may be new to Waltham politics to her very long career? Often when you ask people around town about her, they have strong opinions, but they're big generalizations. It's hard to evaluate what they're telling you because they say she always does this or she never does that. So we wanted to take some specific examples and look back at them. And we thought a good one to look at would be the um, issue of the Armory Project, because this touches on her and how she works with committees. It also touches on housing and what's going on with affordable housing in Waltham. This was a project from um, about two year, one to two years ago. It was one of the first issues I really paid attention to closely uh, when I started following Waltham politics. So I didn't understand everything that was going on. At the time, uh, I did not know Christine. She was just a character in the story as far as I knew. So I'm really excited to get her perspective on it. Um, so I'm going to summarize very briefly. So basically, the armory is an old armory building. It's a historic landscape. It's in the south side of Waltham. It's been vacant for many decades. It's considered a land uh, historic landmark, but it's not safe to go inside. It's not safe if trespassers go in there. And in fact, a police officer got hurt a few years ago chasing someone in there. Um, so a two nonprofit organizations, one is Watch CDC, which we've talked about a lot on this show. They're the primary organization um, advocating housing in Waltham, and then Metro West CD, which is a similar organization, but it's for the whole region. They put forth a proposal to redevelop the armory into units of affordable housing, specifically uh, low-income housing that would be affordable to people who work in Waltham. And they brought that proposal to the Community Preservation Commission, which, as you know, the CPC um, is a law that the Waltham voters passed and it sets aside a certain amount of money which can be used for historic preservation, open space, or community housing. And in the years that Waltham has had a CPC, it has not used very much of that money to build new housing. In fact, at the time that this armory project came up, it had not used any of the money to build new housing. Since then, they funded the um, Leland home, uh, redeveloping that, which adds units of housing for elder housing. And they're also working on a project on Eddy Street that will add a few units of affordable housing. So the uh, people from Metro SCD came to the CPC. They asked for this money. Most of the CPC members were very enthusiastic about it. One person did not seem enthusiastic, and that was Justin Barrett, who's the chair of the CPC. He also seemed surprised that uh, this project, um, he didn't seem to think this project would get the approval of the mayor. Um, so the CPC voted to approve it, but then it went to the long-term debt committee of the city council where Justin Barrett raised some concerns, Councillor McMenamum raised some, some concerns, and they decided to send it to the committee of the whole. And when it was in the committee of the whole, the mayor came in and she and Councillor McMenamin told the council that when the CPC had accepted this application, it was missing certain pieces that were legally required. And therefore they broken their own rules by accepting it and and the councillors had to vote to send it back to them to fix it. Um, so the councillors did end up voting to send it back to the CPC. 
but uh, they did not mean to kill the project. They thought that they, some of them said they were in favor of the project, but it did kill the project because the things that the mayor asking for were things that the organization could not provide. Um, there were three counselors who pushed back on that. One was Councillor Stanley, who had some very strong language about the mayor leading the council by the nose. Uh, the others were Councillor Paz and Councillor Mackin, who's now here. So. Christine, was that a somewhat reasonable um, summary of what happened? Yes, uh, I think that's a good baseline from which to start our discussion. And I've been trying to refresh my memory on some of the details of what happened at that point, but you definitely hit all of the main notes. Um, and I appreciate that we're having this discussion kind of looking backward um, to this particular instance, but I think it is worth discussing because the show didn't exist when this happened. But um, as we move into the next election cycle for city council and for mayor, it does kind of zoom out a little bit and look back on an issue that had a beginning, a middle and an end. And we're not trying to forecast what anybody was doing. We're just covering what happened in this particular instance. Yeah, I agree. That was part of the reason I watched it so closely at the time was I wanted to have one issue where I'd seen the whole process. And it was a kind of a disappointing process because it seemed like a very popular idea. Um, Watch CDC had a petition um, that got a lot of signatures. And probably one of the most interesting things to to me about it as being new to, to Waltham politics was at the beginning of that committee of the whole meeting, several of the counselors said, we like this project, we know it's popular, we don't wanna be perceived as killing this project. And yet they killed it, but it was very hard for people to understand what happened. So, so can you explain a little bit more about what happened? What was the mayor's issue with the application? Okay. so. What I have pulled up in front of me is the meeting minutes from the Committee of the Whole meeting on February 1st of 2021. So if anybody wants to reference the official documents, that's the date that you can look for. It's up on the City Council website. Um, I also want to note that this meeting is noted at the top as being held remotely on Zoom because at that point the City Council was still operating fully remotely due to COVID. Just to quickly run through some of the background. Um, the long-term debt at committee of city council deals with kind of like big spending items and things that once the city puts in the initial outlay of the money, it's stuff that's going to last, it's like durable projects. Um, so it was unusual in the first place that this went from this long-term debt to the committee of the whole. But my recollection is that Councillor McMiniman moved to do that because there were some confusion about the legal requirements to acquire the property. The counselors who supported that motion felt that it was better discussed with everyone present so that we would not be going in circles. The question Councillor Darcy asked was whether or not eight or 10 votes were needed to approve the CPC application. And the answer we got from our law department on the city um, said that the question needed to be researched. Um, that question, my recollection is, was related to some of the state laws about CPC funding, but also related to acquisition of property. Viewers may recall uh, eminent domain conflicts at the city council. Um, if the city is doing what is quote unquote a friendly taking, uh, which is where the property owner has agreed to sell it to the city, I think you only need a simple majority, which is eight votes. But if the property owner has not agreed to sell it, then you need 10 votes. Um, and I'm not sure if it was that acquisition that was driving the question about whether or not we needed eight or 10 votes, but we didn't get a good answer to that question from the city law department at that time. The second question that Councillor Darcy asked was about how much the city could pay for the property. And this became a real sticking point in the Armory Development Project. Under the state law, there's a limit as to how much a municipality can pay for a parcel of property. Um, that is to prevent municipalities from spending unwisely or for using property acquisition as a way to kind of do a kickback to somebody who might be powerful and important. So that's a reasonable law to have in place. But the question is that the city cannot pay more than the as of right use, which means 
the estimated value of the property needed to be based on the existing zoning at the armory site. And the existing zoning at the armory site did not and does not support the number of units and the kind of project that Watch CDC wanted to go through. The unresolved questions in my mind are, there's kind of three main things that I think I never got a satisfactory answer to. And one is, why does it matter what the state law says the city is allowed to pay for property when it was Watch CDC that was purchasing the property? And the way they had laid out the project is the dollar amounts that the city was contributing were not linked precisely to different portions of the project. They had just laid out, here's the funds we need to raise. Will the city kick in this amount? So it's not clear to me that we needed to be following that particular law in this particular case. The second question is, if the city council supported this proposal, we have the power to change the zoning. Um, so we could have modified the zoning for that parcel or that whole zone. It's in a special zone, I believe, but it up against Children's Hospital. We could have changed the zoning to make it allowed to be acquired uh, under the value that the current owner wanted it to be. Kind of the third unanswered question in all of this is, why do we have such a hard time resolving legal questions in front of the city council? And that's kind of a bigger picture zoom out question. Um, Waltham is a big enough municipality that we have our own law department. There are municipalities throughout the Commonwealth that are so small that they um, do contracts with legal firms uh, who will answer one-off questions. Um, but Waltham has its own law department. That law department is appointed by the mayor, confirmed by the city council, and they get paid out of the regular city budget. Our law department was coming to us and saying they didn't have enough information that they needed to do additional research. One of the issues that comes up in that case is that the city council needs to make a request for the law department to go research it, which takes time and energy, but they do not work for us. So we cannot prioritize an issue. We cannot command a response, which leaves us kind of at sea, uh, especially when there is the appearance that the mayor kind of has her thumb on the scale to get a particular answer or to delay a particular issue. Um, I apologize, my cat wants to participate. <laughs> The other part of that is that this, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts does provide legal advice to city councilors uh, and municipal employees under certain circumstances. And I actually reached out to that state legal fresh uh, legal organization to get some advice on this. And what came back as an answer was, I don't know, it depends on the circumstances. Um, so a lot of this like legal stickiness around the CPC application and what we are allowed to do in terms of buying the property or not never got resolved. And it went back to the CPC with all of these unanswered questions. The CPC doesn't have the resources to answer those questions. Watch CDC at that point wasn't going to invest in retaining legal counsel to answer those questions. So despite all of the furor that we don't wanna be perceived as killing this project, we just wanna get an answer to the legal questions. The city council cut off the best way to get those questions answered by sending it back to two bodies that did not have the ability to research and answer those questions. That, that was the most confusing part for me and I'm sure it was a lot of other people. And it's for people that aren't watching these meetings every time, the mayor, weeks or months into the negotiations to make this army project a reality, she decided to say, you guys are doing this wrong. The CPC approved it and it went through the yeah. thing, it went through all the motions, it was in city council, and all of a sudden the mayor was like, oh, by the way, you've been doing this wrong the entire time. And she just decided then to do it. So it goes back to the CBC, which is like unheard of. The CBC dots the I's and crosses the T's. That's their job is to approve the permits. And the mayor just decided for this project to say, you aren't doing this correctly. And the mayor being a lawyer, 
sometimes speaks in riddles and very roundabout ways. And so people are like, is she telling the truth? Is she correct? And I mean, I talked to counselors, I talked to CBC members, everyone had no idea what the hell she was talking about. And is she correct? I mean, she does her research as well. She's probably correct in her own way. Uh, she yeah, I, I wanted to, to to raise a similar point. Yeah, that the the two things. So this was my understanding. The two things she said they were missing was one, they had to have, uh, they had gotten an appraisal of the site, mm -hmm. but it uh, it was assuming that they were going to do what they were going to do on it. And she said you have to have a by right appraisal, which means how much would it be worth if someone did the thing it's zoned for? So it doesn't make sense. So you're saying you have to have an appraisal that assumes something that's not going to happen if the project gets um, approved. Because if the city council wanted to do the project, they could change the zoning and it could happen. The other thing that she said they didn't have was a purchase and sale agreement, meaning in her opinion, they were in order to apply for CPC funding, you have to go to the property you want to buy, hire a lawyer and negotiate a purchase and sale with the landlord before you even apply for the funding. And this actually came up in the very first meeting about it, or one of the very first meetings, where um, Ms. Van Campen, who was representing Watch CDC, said it doesn't make sense to me for me to get a purchase and sale before I know whether you guys want to do this. The point of this process is to find out whether Waltham wants to do this. And if we do, we work together and we make it happen. And that's how CPC was supposed to work. But the mayor said that they were required to put down their application because it said on the application, attach that. So it wasn't like an ordinance that said they had to include that. It was the application had that noted. And then the CPC approved it despite her saying she wasn't going to do that. So the CPC basically, I think there was a question of why can't the CPC make its own rules? Doesn't the CPC voting for it indicate that they have not violated their own rules? And I wonder whether the counselors who voted it down even knew about that conversation that when they voted that she had already said, we can't get the things you're asking for. So they said, we, you know, we want to do this. We just want to do it right. But in reality, what they, they it wasn't going to go anywhere after they sent it back to the CPC. When she explained that she wasn't going to get a purchase and sale, she wanted to know she had the funding, then she'd go back and negotiate with the landlord. Justin Barrett said, whoa, 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 I'm not okay with that. Because all of a sudden, you've gone and made that person's property more valuable than it would have been otherwise. And as I understood it, that was the main reason that the mayor and um, Barrett and McMenamin were against it was because there had been a previous discussion, which the public wasn't totally privy to, uh, because it was a real estate thing where the city had attempted to buy this property, and they didn't get it. And now I think what was going on was the landlord was asking for more than that. So they didn't want to see that landlord get more than they thought his property was worth. And as far as I can tell, that's the reason they stopped it. And it took just those few people to convince all the everyone else. Is that a fair interpretation, Christine? I mean, I, th I think the tricky thing about this, and honestly, looking at similar examples throughout this government is how are we going to separate the facts from the opinions? Um, and I think what you said is a fair interpretation based on the facts. Um, I think an alternative explanation based on the facts is that somebody didn't want to do an affordable housing project in this location, so they found a reason to kill it. Um, and that's something that happens a lot in Waltham city politics is somebody wants to get a certain result, and so they find a legal justification for that. And that that's that is a feature a bug of the american political system i don't really know what to call it that that we've set up these systems of rules for ourselves and that people get to come in and say well in this case interpret this rule this way in that case interpret this rule this way um which allows people to obfuscate their motivations um and allows people who are more conversant with the rules to, to 
lead the people around them to that conclusion or to obfuscate information um, to get the result they want. And that's something that has always discomfited me about the way the mayor speaks and the way the mayor interacts with the law department and with the city council is that she, she often gives the appearance of getting a result that she wants first and then working backwards to the legal justification. And the issue is that very few people have the legal understanding to go in the opposite direction. <laughs> we, we just get to trust what she's saying to us. And it's, it's up to everybody who's watching the show or who's making a vote to decide whether or not they trust her interpretation on that issue. And that's the problem with the law department working for the mayor. And that's the problem with the complications of the legal system is that it, it, it is so difficult for anybody who wants a different result to make any headwinds when you have all of these players and these moving parts in this very, very complicated system. That might have been way down a garden path and not related to what you were asking me. Um, no, that's the, uh, that's uh, that's what we really want to get at here is so that, I mean, I think to me, that seems like a pattern. It's the mayor. She very rarely says, here's what I want to see happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, here's what I here's my vision for the Fernald. Here's my vision for the farm outside the high school, whatever. Instead, it's here's what has to happen because the rules require it. And if you want something different to happen, I'm not going to talk about the merits. Mm -hmm. um, we're just going to talk about the rules. And in fact, when I I was curious when I was watching the Armory, what was her position on affordable housing? So I looked in old articles and I went back to 2010. I found an article where she said, in general, she does not approve of turning commercial property into residential ever because commercials um, tax at a higher rate. And once it becomes residential, it's taxed at a lower rate, which doesn't address, address the question of, well, what if that commercial property has been sitting there for 40 or 50 years? Is there still an opportunity cost? But that was something she said to the Globe in like 2010. And it's very hard to find statements she's made. Is that her personality? Or is that somehow have to do with the way this, this system works, where you, you have to be careful about stating your intentions, because you might accidentally make someone's property more valuable or less valuable or I guess what I'm really asking is if we had a new mayor how much could they actually change of that huh. in my opinion a lot um I think as I was saying the there's so many ways you can interpret the legal system I think if somebody came in who wanted to develop affordable housing they would find a way um that's going to be another tricky point for anybody who comes into office after McCarthy eventually is no longer the mayor is that they're going to be left with a law department that she appointed and was confirmed by the council. Um, and all appointed city employees are entitled to a certain term of service. Um, so there are ways that her influence will linger, even if there is a different mayor, which is going to make it tricky to make any headway for the first couple of years after her administration ends at whatever point. But my, my opinion is that she is a very active mayor and she really puts her thumb on the scales in the city. And I think if we elected a, another very active mayor who put their thumb on the scales in a different way, they would probably have some battles to fight early on, but that we could see a different outcome. And what I was saying earlier about we have these layers of interpretation and like, I think I'm very much in the role of a commentator here, but if you look at facts, the facts are that the city has developed very little affordable housing while Jeanette McCarthy has been the mayor. And we have spent very little of our CPC funds on affordable housing. And the majority of those projects have been maintenance of existing affordable housing in the city and not development of new affordable housing. And there's one other thing that really gets me heated about this Armory project specifically, is that if you did the math out for the total cost of the project versus the number of units, the cost per unit was about a quarter of a million dollars. And a lot of people looked at that and said, oh, that's too much cost per unit. This isn't a, an effective project from a financial point of view. But then other projects came into the city council on a smaller scale with a smaller total dollar figure. But if you did the math, the cost per unit was about a quarter of a million dollars. And it makes me really angry 
that for some projects that's too much money, but for other projects that's totally fine. Um, and the difference is the projects that are not getting approved are ones originated by outside groups. And the projects that are getting approved are ones that it originated within the mayor's administration. But there are not enough of them to meet the housing needs of the city of Waltham. And the private sector is not doing it. And the public sector is not doing it. And people are getting pushed out of Waltham because of that. So I started with the facts. I merged, I merged into the opinion lane. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but, thank you for that. No, that's yeah. really helpful. And that answers all my questions, actually. Do other people have questions I, for Christine or comments? You heard into the, uh, the pricing of it. And it, it. It's worth remembering that it's not like this was some sort of like social housing project or something like that. This is like a market solution mm -hmm. to housing that is creating units that would be for people to pay a landlord to live in. And mm -hmm like the only real exception to the to the norm really for waltham is that most of these units were below what the normal threshold for affordable is which is like 80 plus percent in some of these bigger more expensive luxury developments most of these were 30 to 50 percent of memory serves or 30 to 60. but that it, it, it's what it was getting to is also that um with the the Leland home, I think there was initially like a some neighbor backlash to it that was then sort of worked through. Was there anything like that for the Armory project or did they just take it onto themselves to kill it without any, even, any neighbors even voicing concern? To the best of my knowledge, there was no opposition from the neighbors. That said, um, that property is bounded on one side by an apartment complex and there's a pretty big buffering between the two in terms of like open space and then the other side is part of children's hospital and then there's homes uh on the other two corners and that all sits within ward nine so if there were neighbors reaching out they would have probably gone to their ward counselor first and then to at-large counselors second um and as the ward seven counselor i didn't hear anything from them um if there was the voice of the public i it did not seem to have been heard on the council floor I remember hearing people, I remember there being neighbors who were against it, maybe on social media and stuff. They were yeah. concerned about the parking because it wasn't going to have a lot of parking for that amount of units. Mm -hmm. But the idea is these are people who won't have cars or will only have one car per family. Mm -hmm. And people were skeptical of that, which that's a, a kind of legit discussion to have, but we never really got to have that discussion. Yes. Yes. I think that's really fair, actually. And it, it was very few parking spaces relative to other developments in the city. So I share concerns that there's at minimum the appearance that the mayor make decisions on issues like the armory project ahead of time and then work backwards with justifications in the way that you mentioned. Uh, are there any other instances that you can think of from your tenure in city council that might um, sort of support that idea? I want to say yes, and I want to say that one of them was when the council was evaluating whether or not to change the apportionment of costs for paving a private way. Um, that was another great example of the mayor in her finest form coming in in front of the council um, and making all of these arguments about what she is and is not permitted and what the council is and is not permitted to do. Uh, and the council passed an ordinance modification that she didn't agree with, so she vetoed it and sent it back. Um, I don't know if that's a fair example though, because the council then modified the ordinance so that it complied with what she was saying. So she didn't kill it, she just kind of delayed it. Uh, and maybe in that case, she kind of was acting in good faith. I was gonna say certainly something, I think some of the viewers know that I'm sort of the um, cannabis 
specialist, mm -hmm. perhaps, um, in terms, terms of reporting and keeping up are one of them. And um, I, I share concerns that although I, I would like to have faith that our mayor will execute her duties as the host community ex executor, um, host community agreement executor, that there are some issues coming up that are being sent to the law department at a very late stage in the game, um, which may be appropriate, but also perhaps could have been addressed much earlier in the process with the applicants for retail cannabis. Of course, you know, very different. It's a very different issue than affordable housing, but just in terms of looking at um, this idea that the mayor perhaps may have an idea of how she wants things to go and how does that impact mm -hmm. what, what path is followed? Um, what power does city council have and how how do things play out is my biggest concern. I think it goes back to what Christine and Josh were talking about. It's about, it's about perception. And the mayor has been doing this for 20 years now, and she's perfected using, like Christine said, um, the law, but also just, just wordsmithing and just knowing how to go about things to make it to make the perception that things that she does not want to happen not happen but not to seem like she made it not happen and there are many many instances about that um one that i wanted to bring up today was healthy waltham um healthy waltham is a nonprofit in the city that since the pandemic has been putting on uh food pantries twice a month that feeds several hundred people every single time i worked as their volunteer coordinator for two years um and uh now that i don't work there i want to go on the record as saying that the mayor hates that pantry uh, but she can't come out and say that she can't say that she doesn't want this to operate in her city um and the tricky thing is on paper which is exactly what she's good at doing is that on paper, the city of Waltham loves Healthy Waltham. Uh, they provide a police detail every single time. They allow Healthy Waltham to use the government center uh, basement and half of their entire parking lot the entire day for the pantry. Um, they allow, they get the DPW, the Department of Public Works to pick up their trash and recycling every single pantry. So on paper, the, the city of Waltham can say, uh, you know, we love Healthy Waltham and we love this pantry. But the truth is that the mayor has been incredibly critical of every single thing the pantry has ever done and has tried her hardest to shrink the pantry across, across the years. And very, very recently, um, just this past year, she was successful in eliminating our drive-up portion. We used to do 800, 900 families uh, through a hybrid drive-through walk-up model. And the mayor eventually was just like, you eliminate this drive-up uh, portion or you will not be doing it on municipal owned land. And so uh, with without any real way to operate without it, we decided to give up our drive up portion. And now we're doing, we, as if I still work there, um, now they're doing 450, 500 on a good day. Um, and so that's, it's just the perception. It's the mayor can say, and I bet she will, I bet she'll use it as a talking point when she runs again, if there's an opponent, which there probably isn't, um, that she supports combating food insecurity because of all these things she's done for health and welfare. But the truth is that she has berated and belittled the staff, the volunteers, the, the guests, every chance, every chance she gets. And that's just, this is the MO of our sitting mayor of being able to strategically get what she wants and make it not seem like that's what she wants at the same time. 
one of the yeah oh, and I, i'm gonna just back chris up real quick but on that um that as a counselor she was before the council multiple times on matters related to healthy waltham will the council approve putting them at this site will the council approve putting them at that site and um we kept dragging in the director of the the group to come talk to the city council and then like postponing the meetings or just like being really disrespectful of their time um and sending kind of mixed messages about like it'll be here for a while it'll be there for a while and moving it around and meanwhile like the people the people the council serves and the people that the pantry was serving are just stuck in this limbo and we're changing the instructions every time and when they get into a routine that works we're going to pull the rug out from under them um so the, the it's in the public record too that that healthy waltham was not i think not treated respectfully in front of the city council i did I definitely want to second the whole moving around being very disruptive and especially like when they relocated like where they were allowed to store food after they moved out of the um uh, out of the church that they've been operating out of, they ended up uh, getting temporarily allowed to store food across the river in the Fitch School building, and but not allowed to operate or serve people out of there. And so they ended up having to drive back and forth the food from there to where they were distri distributing it. Yeah, it's an easy, it's an easy example. The the city of Waltham would say we gave Healthy Waltham the Fitch to store their food, but you can't distribute food out of there, which would be totally possible and a great solution to a lot of our, a lot of the nonprofits problems. But because we don't want that to happen, you can store food there and we'll be able to say that we're helping you, but that's not exactly as helpful as we could be. And also as other cities do, other cities and their nonprofits, because we travel to all of them, uh, other cities worked hand in hand, welcoming, enthusiastic, but the mayor just was never enthusiastic about the high numbers that we were putting out there. And I mean, just from my own opinion, it's because she didn't want that spotlight. It's the, the spotlight wasn't there before us. And then people just began asking, like, why is a thousand people coming to this pantry on the South side? Like what's going on in the South side that a thousand people need to wait in line all day. Some people waiting seven, eight hours just for some food. And so I don't think the mayor particularly enjoyed those questions being raised about her city. And now she can say, yeah, there's a humble pantry of 400 people. Um, to circle back to, and like the mayor's sort of uh, tactic of sidestepping her like actual motivations and the way that she goes about objecting to things. I remember following the Armory Project at the time and finding it odd that the issue that they had was that they might hypothetically be overpaying for a property or that would then be getting developed or something like that as, as if like that was like the worst possible thing that the city could do is accidentally pay someone a little too much money for a property when like so many properties have been taken recently and like that hasn't seemed to be nearly the issue it's just it seemed like it was a convenient issue to raise and much like that a lot of things seem to sort of follow that thing where because we have such a labyrinth in process, any issue that can get raised suddenly becomes a blocking issue, no matter how, the magnitude of that in other things of similar scale. Just things that you've all said before. Well, thank you, Christine, for being here. Uh, I think that's we're going to talk a lot more about the issues here <laughs> raised here in the next year. But I feel like we've given our audience some some factual background to stand on and some good solid examples of what we're talking about. So, yeah. Uh, with, yeah. So you thank you. Helpful. And I have a lot of opinions, uh, but I'm glad you <laughs> found, like the facts helpful as well. So, may not. And uh, so that, so we also are going to have, I'm going to hand it back to Chris. So for those who don't know, both Chris and Emily worked very hard on Heather's campaign. And I'd like to uh, hear from both of you on, on how you're feeling about it. But uh, back to you, Chris. Yeah, I mean, in the same vein, uh, discussing electoral isms, uh, the mayor is running again next year. Uh, there'll be city council races. Um, and I'm hoping that we can continue the momentum of Heather's campaign. And Emily, you can speak to your experiences with that. But 
we need to take city politics seriously. The people in Waltham, especially of the progressive ideology, we need to take this very seriously. And I think Josh, you will have put up the graphic uh, during this talk about how many people didn't vote in this election. Most, you know, let's talk about Tom Stanley wins. Tom Stanley didn't win, not voting one, not voting one by a landslide. And it's just, it's just a shame. I mean, like, I don't, I'm not, I don't really enjoy the talking point that liberals love to use about like vote. You have to vote. That's the most important thing you can do. The, that's like the bare minimum you can do. Just like, just vote, just vote, just do it. And then do a bunch of other stuff that's way more important, like organizing your community about learning skills and trades that are helpful. And, but just, just vote. Why is it, that's not that hard. But anyway, I'm going on into myself. Um, Emily, I will give it to you first to talk a little bit about your experience campaigning in Waltham for Heather May. Sure. Well, certainly having the election the day after Labor Day was challenging, yeah. but Heather May ran a great race. And um, I, I agree with Chris. We built amazing momentum and to have a difference of 313 votes. Um, you know, we earned every vote. Chris was out, you know, doing many multiple, um, you know, we call them turf series of door knockings in different areas, you know, every day. Um, you know, I don't know how many doors I got to, but I put, a lot of miles in and um, we really strengthened the progressive coalition that we've been building over the past, you know, getting towards, closer towards a decade now. Um, and I think that is one of the best outcomes of this race. So it's of course disappointing that Heather May did not win. However, I think that it's a win in the sense that we have brought progressives back together and we've got mm -hmm. this really strong coalition going into the local elections next year, the city council mm -hmm. races, the mayoral races. Um, and I think that there's some, you know, lessons to be learned for myself. I think uh, every every minute counts, you know, getting involved earlier in the race for myself. Um, you know, May or June seems early in, in an election at the time when a primary is in September or the elections in November, but it's not. And mm -hmm. um, I think that progressives really need to take advantage of the work we're able to put in and the grassroots um, sensibility of, you know, what, you know, pounding the pavement, so to speak, or, you know, if someone's able to do calls or mm -hmm. if someone's able to do a little bit of extra social media, that's where we win is interfacing um, with folks in the community. Uh, and that's and that's our strength. But the earlier we can do it, um, and the earlier we can support our progressive candidates, that's how we're going to win. But I feel great about, um, you know, I feel that the progressives are really united in Waltham following this race. Yeah, was, I think. But, sorry, what was the final gap between Stanley and uh... three hundred and thirteen, if I recall? So I was, just check, I was checking the 2021 at large race results. And if you came within 313 of Stanley, you would have come ahead of a lot of counselors. Yeah, yeah. That, the current sitting ones. Uh, yeah, I'm curious like what the difference is between people voting for Tom Stanley as a city counselor and a, and a state rep. And I think one of the big things is that Republicans can vote for Tom Stanley as a city counselor and they can't vote for him as a state rep. Um, and Emily, I think I think you were right that um, progressives do need to capitalize on the hard work that we do. Um, and I've noticed that as well, just like 
the non-incumbents have to work so much harder. And that's just true across the board for any, any election. And it's tough because the incumbents, the supporters, they have kind of like a generational organizing advantage where a lot of the incumbents are supported by long-term lived in Waltham forever. And they're able to just slowly acquire the relationships and the voting uh, trends and uh, having those conversations over years with their neighbors and progressives, you know, and working class of the city, they're often moving around. They're often getting priced out. They don't really have that kind of time to be able to have those conversations over years. So we need to work very hard to make those kind of connections very quickly with people at the doors to say, this is what's important. This is why I think it's important. And you gotta get that person to trust you despite you know maybe not having lived here for very long. Absolutely. Um, what I was, sorry, go ahead. Um, I forget my point, go ahead. I say, what I was hearing on the doors, the only people who were telling me outright that they were voting for the incumbent were people who uh, told me in so many words that the incumbent owed them a favor, truly, um, or that they, they owed the incumbent a favor, um, or that they went to high school with him, or they've just you know known him for all their life. Uh, there were no policy-based or values-based um, or, you know, fact-based reasons people gave me that they were voting for the incumbent. Uh, and that's very telling. And Chris, I think you make a, a great point that although, you know, the progressives may need to work harder in terms of actually presenting information, convincing people, doing the groundwork, um, Waltham is changing, attitudes are changing, um, demographics continue to evolve, and, um, and you know, it's the attitudes that we can, we can work with, and we saw that when you speak with people, it matters. Um, I think that uh, old Waltham won't just have I went to high school with this guy on my side. But it's going to require those conversations to be had. It doesn't matter how diverse or ever-changing Waltham is, as long as the people that are there and have always been there and are controlling the conversation and are doing the organizing, as, as long as there's no counter-organizing, then nothing will ever change. I let, I said during my campaign that the next census, there would be more Spanish speaking Walthamites than English speaking Walthamites. And I still do believe that. But unless we can all organize ourselves politically, nothing will change in any in any real material way for the Spanish speaking residents of Waltham, unless we do any of that. It's just, it's just uh, like um, forgetting his name. Boots, Boots Riley, um, talking about how like despair doesn't breed rebellion. Organizing does. Just because something is shitty doesn't mean that things are going to change. You have to actually organize around it. Um, you had mentioned about starting earlier, and I think I think that's a really big lesson learned, and. And I'm very happy that we can now vote by mail and we can vote early, but what we're not learning and what, what a lot of people aren't learning is that it, it moves the dial a little bit. You have to change up. You have to start earlier. When we can start, people can, when people can start voting a month before the election even starts, and voting by mail is very popular, then everything needs to shift back a month. So that is definitely a lesson. The, um, one, one of the things you mentioned about the demographics is interesting too, because like part of understanding like what's going on in city government requires paying attention. And if the process is almost intentionally obfuscated, I can only imagine how difficult it is to follow if you're not, if it's also not in your native language. Of course, yeah. 
I mean, I talked about it in my in my race is that, you know, we can get our city council meetings recorded. We can get them captioned. What do we need to be doing next? Not, not, a, not a maverick idea, by the way. We need to get automatic Spanish translations in all of our city council meetings. But it's not unheard of. It's not impossible. It's just, are we willing to put our money into that kind of transparency? So to follow up on what you're saying about starting early, if anyone in our audience is even slightly thinking about running for office next year, feel free to get in touch with anyone on this show and we can all connect you to people, especially if you consider yourself a progressive, we can connect you to people who may be able to help you build that community. But now's the time to start thinking about yeah. it because especially if you wanna run against someone really established, um, you have to start very early. Um, our friend Christy Mackin was a great example of someone not entrenched in the community, uh, but just willing to put put her name out there and was a likable candidate and just did the work, just knocked on doors and won. And, uh, and that was just because people in the progressive community made the ask. Of course, she had she had aspirations, but made the ask. I also want to say that there's a lot of dignity in running for office, even if you don't win because you you get to go out and speak to people and hear what the issues are and make them feel like somebody cares about them and what their issues are. So so many often, blah, 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 blah. it's been a long week, guys. Um, so often incumbents put very little effort into running a campaign uh, unless there is an opponent who's hot on their heels that their constituents don't feel like the government sees them and sees what their problems are. And you can give a voice to those people and you can give them some dignity in their, in their life just to recognize that our government can and should and must do better for people. Um, and I think that's, that's a valuable thing to do. It's an important part of our democracy to give people choices. Um, so I hope people hear this call to action and consider running. And I hope that some of them win and I would love to support them. Um, and even if you go into this with your eyes wide open that it's gonna be an uphill battle, it is worth doing. It's it's 100% worth doing. Absolutely. And also equally, if not more important than running for office is helping people run for office because it requires an insane amount of hours knocking on doors and making phone calls. And, and even if you can't do those things, which seem daunting, but is actually fine uh, once you do it a couple of times, there's also a lot of back end stuff too. It's a lot of data management. It's a lot of making graphs. It's a lot of making writing emails. It's a lot of spitballing ideas. So literally if you have just the will to want to make Waltham better, we can plug you in to how to make that happen. So I hope you do. And it's a lot of fun. So it's, you know, it's a great way to get involved in the community. It's a great way to build solidarity and um, you build the progressive movement, but it is frankly just also a lot of fun. So that's my plug for uh, joining in, um, progressive campaigning in the Waltham. I think that's a great way to end this segment and to end our debrief show. Um, so we'll be back next week to talk about what went on at the city council. Um, I am uh, anticipating not much, um, spoiler, um, <laughs> but uh, hopefully we can have other uh, interesting things to talk about. Um, if you have any ideas for, um, discussion items of people we should be chatting with feel free to reach out if you want to come and chat about anything we would love to do that as well um and yeah any closing thoughts thanks for joining us emily and, yes, and christine you, emily. too this was thank great you. you're welcome it was nice thank to you. you bye everyone see you all next week. bye everyone have a great night